Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for each person here today that are listening, Lord, and we just pray that you would um, speak through Pastor Izzy now, Lord. We pray that you would fill him with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Let mm. him speak clearly to encourage us, Lord, the sheep of your pasture. Mm. We ask this now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, guys, I was, uh, we, we're having the privilege of doing the Bible studies like we do in the week for um, our midweek service. We're doing first P- or Second Peter 1. And then also we're doing it in more focused in depth with the youth on Friday nights. And so we're looking at how the, there's different qualities that Peter says. In First Peter 1, he says in verses 5 to 7 that you have to add to your faith certain qualities. And we memorize them. I, I'm going to call on one of these guys. Tim, can you remember? What, uh, 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 David, you could do it. Uh, what was the first thing we added to our faith? Do you remember? Goodness. goodness. And then we added to our goodness... What's on the top? Knowledge. knowledge. And then the knowledge? Self-control. And then self-control? Perseverance. Perseverance. See, this kid is sharp. This is a sharp kid. And then after that, what did we add? Do you remember? Godliness and brotherly kindness. And what's the last thing? Love. Okay. So we did this for the little visual aid association trick, and uh, but I loved it. The little one's already got it. I mean, he's got it. You know the fun part is? I bet you he could do it backwards. You don't think so, huh? David, what comes before love? Brotherly. And what came before brotherly kindness? What's the other nest? You got it. You got it. What came before that? Perseverance. See? You can go backwards through this. What came before goodness? Faith. You can go from jump around and do it. See, this kid, the, the thing is, is that the, the scripture says that when we, when we start off with our faith, when Peter was writing that letter, he knew that the Lord had made it clear to him he was about to die. The Lord had appeared to Peter, told him, Peter, you, the time of your departure from this earth is imminent. And those of you that know church history, what happened to Peter just shortly after he wrote Second Peter? They took him out from the prison and they went to crucify him. They said, oh, you're one of those Jesus freaks, you know, follow Jesus. We're going to kill you the same way we, they, that your, your leader was killed. And they went to crucify him. He said, I'm not worthy to die in the same manner as my Lord. So he asked that they would turn him upside down. And they went... He crazy? Okay. I mean, they already thought Christians were crazy. So they turned, they obliged him. They turned him upside down and crucified him upside down. And he departed this world. But right before he did, he said, after th- about three decades of pastoring the early church, he said, you need to have faith and you need to have it active and you need to have it having these qualities being in your life that you add to your faith. You add to your faith goodness or moral excellence and you add to your moral excellence knowledge the knowledge of the Lord and you add to that self-control and you add to that self-control perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness and lastly what's the last thing we added love he says because if these qualities are yours and they are increasing in other words you're just constant how many of you know we're all just works in progress we're all just growing right we're getting we're not there, but we're trying to add these qualities to our, our spiritual journey, to our faith, so that we can, we can experience what Peter said. He said, if you have these qualities, and they're increasing, okay? You might not have a lot of, maybe you don't have a, a, a lot of knowledge of the Lord. You're new. That's okay. Just day by day, we continue to learn, right? Maybe you don't have a lot of self-control. I know I didn't come wired with a lot of that. But, you know, it's interesting. When you keep seeking the Lord, does he help you out in those areas that you need help? Sure. And so as you continue to follow him, you want to have these qualities. Peter said, if these qualities are yours and they are increasing, they will neither render you useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you really want to be 
useful. Forget being useless. I, I, I don't know. Did anyone sign up to be a Christian so you could be useless? Not me. But yet, there are a lot of Christians that don't think they really need to add to their faith any of these qualities. They're like, look, I have faith. I'm a Christian. So what? You know, just because I live like the devil all week, it doesn't matter. I don't need to do that other stuff. And the problem is they don't realize Peter would say you, they became blind, short-sighted. They, they lost the perspective of why did Jesus save us? Just so that we could, you know, he goes, well, yeah, I see you're in sin and, you're, and you have a pretty rough go of it. But, you know, I died for that. So I forgive you. And, um, and I'm going to give you everlasting life. And then, and then, well, good luck with the rest of it down there. Is that what he did? No. The Lord said, I came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. And the abundant life, I believe, you know, he's teaching us that he came, to, yes, to give us everlasting life. But there's the life that we got to lead down here. And that life is truly more abundant when we have an active, growing faith. When we're adding to our faith that goodness, or uh, another translation, my translation says moral excellence. When we add moral excellence, that's goodness, to our faith. You know, there's nothing worse, I think, than because it gives Christians a bad name, is when you have the, the ones who profess to have faith, but they don't live that morally excellent life. You know what I'm talking about, right? A little bit sliding on the morals. And so everyone's going, hypocrites, you know. They say they're Christians, but look how they live. I mean, I know, I know people in the world don't live that bad. Does that ever happen, by the way, today? I mean, in, in Christian experience, that there are Christians that are not living morally at all the time, right? That's what we're going to study today in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. That even back in the day of the Bible days, when Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth, in their church, he actually has to address that they have, their morals are slipping. I mean, they actually have a man in the church with bad morals, and it's, and it's, Paul's going to say, it's like a leaven. And he says, you know, only you need a little leaven. Leaven's what? You guys know this first, right? It, by the way, it's in chapter 5. It, it, a little, that, that yeast, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It, it, it fouls the whole thing. And so Paul has to address, can you imagine you have to address that there's immorality in the church? That would never happen, right? I mean, we, we, wouldn't, we probably don't even need this chapter today, right? We could just tear it out. It doesn't apply anymore. Or does it? It does. We still have this happening even in Christianity today where, and, and you know, I, I know that the Bible, God was, it says it was inspired by the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost knew we needed some instructions in all different aspects of our faith, all different areas. He knew that there's going to be things we, we, we're going to need help. How do we deal with? So today we're going to look at how does Paul deal with some morals that are slipping in the Corinthian church and you, you know first of all before I get into this I just I was reminded when Tim and I were talking about he got a staph infection on his knuckle this week just a little you said it's just like a little puka and then yeah, anyone here get one of the staph infections from around here you know they're, they're hor I, I was telling Tim I said yeah see this scar it looks like um the division sign this line and then the two dots that's those scars are from I had just one scratch from the trailer, uh, I tra just a little scratch, you know, enough that it, it just like drew a little bit of blood. So I washed it out when I got home. And, uh, and I, p I have this stuff, that, that new skin, the, the liquid bandage stuff, you know, it stings like a bugger, but it, it's for active people, it works good. You know, you just paint it on and it like seals it. And so I painted it on, I sealed it, healing up great. And then um, we had a brother, I'm not going to tell you his name, but he, he was staying with us. And he, he wasn't always doing morally upright things. And sometimes he'd go out drinking. And i tell him, don't bring that to my house. It's not allowed. You know, I don't want you to bring that around my kids. I have little ones. And so he respected that. He didn't come around. But he would go down here to the beach and camp out when he'd go on his walkabouts, you know, that is his binges. And he'd be gone for a while. And he'd come back and he'd be all scraped up. It was just one of those things. Every time he'd leave for a week, by the time we saw him a week later, he was all scratched up, banged up, got in fights, whatever. And um, so he came back to us, and it was like, oh, go clean up. You know, you got scrapes and cuts all over. And, and um, 
he, he saw that I used my little liquid bandage, and he goes, could I use some of that? And so um, I had a little bit left in the bottle. I gave it to him, and he painted it, and it seemed to work pretty good for him. And so I did, unbeknownst to me, the other little bottle that, that I was using, he went and grabbed it. And he painted right over his um, staph infection that was weeping. It had the, you know, the weepy stuff coming out. And he sealed it. But he painted it, and it has like a little brush on the applicator. You know what I'm talking about? Those little thing that kind of looks like a fingernail polish thing, you know, at the end. And he painted over his staph infection and then stuck the brush back into the bottle. Well, guess who used the bottle next? And I go, and my, heal, my wound is like almost completely healed. And that's, by the way, how I got the staph infection. I painted with the infected brush over my little scratch that was almost, almost healed. And all of a sudden, my leg, by the end of the day, feels like someone's sticking a knife. You know, if you had a raging staph infection, you know what I'm talking about. It felt like a knife was going down to the bone in my knee. And I look down, and it's weeping out of the, out of the little scratch. I mean, un under the liquid bandage, it's just like pumping out juice from some, and it didn't look proper. I was like, this is not good. And I looked down, and it had weeped down, and it had kind of like settled right here, and it started eating a hole. And it made a, a hole about this big. Excuse me, please. I'm oh, fix I'm me up. Yes. Yeah, yeah, OK. <laughs> and so, so, they, so it eats a hole below. And then I go, this is, what, what is going on? It feels like someone's sticking a second ice pick in my leg. And then I put my leg up because it's just throbbing. Not paying attention that now which way is the liquid going to drain? The other way. So then it's dripping this way, and it puts another puka in my leg and just eats a hole. And I can't get it to stop. I have to finally go get, you know, the antibiotics and do a couple waves before it finally kicks it, you know, out of my system. And those of you, anyone can identify you've had a, an infection or something. You had to do the whole antibiotic route, all this stuff, just to get rid of this thing. And, you, you know, you think, what? What a pain. But that very experience, as I was reflecting on today's sermon, I was thinking, Lord, you know, how do I explain this chapter? Because this chapter, to some people, will, will make them think that Paul was uptight. And I don't think Paul was uptight at all, because if you, if you study about Paul, the life of Paul, he, was, he called himself the chiefest of, amongst the sinners. He was the one, he said, that, that had done the most sin, and yet God showed him grace. And if you know anything about Paul's teaching, did Paul ever teach about grace and mercy? I mean, of all of the teachers of the New Testament, this guy had grace and mercy down. And so he would always, you know, point out the things of grace and of mercy to, to the flock. And here he's got a right to the church at Corinth because, now remember, he had pastored there for a year and a half on his previous missionary journey. And now he's writing back to the, to the church that he spent a lot of time. He had, he's been personally involved in these people's lives. So we read in chapter 5 that he got a report. Let's look together at verse 1. It says, and it was actually reported, Paul says, that there is an immorality amongst you. An immorality, he says, of such a kind that does not even exist amongst the Gentiles. He says that someone has his father's wife. We, this is in the biblical sense of has them, you know, like he, there's a fella in the church taking his father's wife to bed, bedding his father's wife. And so he says, um, you know, I mean, there's morals in the moral code of life, even in the world, they don't do that, you know, and he goes, and you guys are doing that in the church. You got a guy doing that in, in your church? Listen to what Paul says. He says, you guys have become arrogant and you have not mourned. Instead, so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. It's interesting. Paul says, you know, you haven't even mourned that this guy is doing this immoral act in your church. Like, this is a bad deal. Now, wh wh when do, why would you mourn anyway? When, when do we mourn? Someone dies, usually. You know, when someone dies, we, we mourn over their passing. Or, 
or even I've seen parents mourn over their children when not that they died, but say the child's making a a pretty bad life style or mistake, you know, in their in their decision making. And the parent, you you've run into parents, right, where they're just you can tell their heart is grieved. They're like, what's the matter? Uh, I can't tell you. My kid is, you know, doing something that it's just. It, they, they're mourning inside to see their own kid doing this thing just like kills them. They're just hurt by it. Paul says that the church at Corinth didn't even mourn that this was going on. They didn't see anything, I guess, didn't see anything wrong. Remember, Corinth was the place what we, I told you it was like the Las Vegas of the ancient world. It was the, you know, sin city. So it, unfortunately, it's weird because when you become a Christian, you're, you're brought into the light. As a, as a child of God, you're now in his light. And the things of darkness, well, his light exposes and he takes you out of that darkness. He brings you away from those things. But here Paul says that they were called into this, to the church, and they had, you know, they're being called to get, Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am, what? In the midst. That's where the light is. When you get together in his name, Christ is right there in your midst, and you've got the light of the Lord. And yet, they had this guy who was participating in darkness and hanging out in the church. And Paul says, you guys haven't even mourned about this, that, you know, something would be done. So Paul says, for, for on my part, now listen to what he says, and I'm going to go back to that analogy of the, of the staph infection in just a minute because I want to show you something. He says, Paul says, on my part, though I'm absent in the body, but I'm, I'm present with you in spirit. Remember, he's in jail. He's writing to them. I'm not there with you physically, but my spirit is still with you. He still cares about these people. He says, and, and I have already judged this man who has committed this as though I were present. I already recognize this is not good. And so in the name of our Lord Jesus, he says, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He said, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven, a little yeast, leavens the whole lump of dough? He says, clean out the old leaven so that you might be a new lump. Just as, in fact, he says, you are that unleavened bread. For Christ, our Passover, he was unleavened, remember, that Christ who is our Passover and what has also been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice or the leaven of wickedness or the leaven of, 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 uh, um, uh, of uh, sorry, of malice, wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth versus the leaven of, what's the difference between unsin uh, of sincerity? It would be insincerity or lies. We don't have people do lying in church, do we? You know, this is the thing Paul says, we got to get rid of that. That's the old leaven. He says, and I wrote to you, my brethren, not to associate with immoral people. Now, I do not mean the, all the immoral people of this world. He said, or else otherwise, or, or with the covetous, or with the swindlers, or the idolaters. For, he says, for then you'd have to go out of the world. There's no way to get away from them. They're everywhere. But he says, but I actually wrote to you that you would not associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or he is covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. He says, for what do you have to do with judging outsiders? That's not your business. He says, do, he, he says, do you not judge those that are within the church? He says, but those who are outside the church, God judges. Therefore, he says, and he quotes Deuteronomy here, in chapter 18, he says, therefore, remove the wicked man from amongst yourselves. Now, this is something, if you read the Old Testament law, if you did wickedness in the Old Testament, they didn't just remove you. I mean, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Deuteronomy 18. It's that chapter where it says, if you have a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises and he says, thus, you know, I prophesy this, and it comes to pass. 
he says, that's not the measure of a true prophet. Because if after the, the, the sign or wonder comes to pass that he prophesies, it, it, it happens. And then he says, see, since I gave you a sign and it happened, let's go follow other gods. Because I'm the guy that, you know, can call the signs. You know what it says in Deuteronomy 18? It says that you should take that prophet, that dreamer of dreams, and stone him to death because he has, he has tried to lure you away from loving the Lord your God. The greatest command we're given is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And he says, and if a, a true prophet, by the way, will always point you back to God, to loving God. But it's, it's, and I know that it's counterintuitive. Some people think, well, you measure whether they're really truly a prophet by if they prophesy and their sign comes true. But see, Deuteron Deuteronomy 18 says, even if they prophesy and the sign comes true, what really makes them a true prophet is that they point you back to the Lord. If they get you to go after any other gods, they're not true prophets. You know, the devil can call it right once in a while. Hey, I think the sun's going to rise tomorrow. Whoa, it's a sign. It happened, you know. I mean, that will pick stupid stuff and then and cloaks it like he's some genius or something. And people go, oh, I guess it's sad. That was a sign, man. Better follow him. He says we should go over here and worship Satan, you know. And No. You got to follow the Lord. And so Paul, quote, now Paul knows the Old Testament. It's clear. He says, you drive out the wicked man from amongst you. He quotes right there from Deuteronomy 18. He says, you know, you don't leave that wicked person having that influence. You have him take him out of your assembly. And yet, people say to me, but well, isn't this harsh? He, th he told them, you know, I judge this guy. You turn him over to Satan. So, for what? So his body would be destroyed, but what would be saved? His soul. What does Paul really care about? The eternal picture, right? Now, by the way, for those of you that don't know church history, help out those of you that know the story here. After, after Paul wrote this letter, did they put that guy out of the church? Yes. What happened with that guy? Anyone know? You, can, you actually can know this by reading 2 Corinthians. He repented. It woke him up. It was like a wake-up call. Paul had to write 2 Corinthians to say, now that you put him out and he's repented... They were, they were so good at putting him out. They're like, we put him out, man. Whew, we're good. He says, yeah, but the guy's repented. He, he broke away his sin. Now what, what does he write in 2 Corinthians? Now go get him back and restore him. Job done. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com Mahalo and God bless.